It's good to see each and every one of you here for this midweek uh, Bible study. We're in the book of Deuteronomy. We're in lesson eight. And you have an outline that you can prepare the answers for. They have questions, and hopefully you've done that. To, so you'll be involved in the, in the text and understand some principles that we're learning as we go through the text. Last, uh, last class period we had, we had what was to be written on the stones, the, the law of Moses that he gave. Maybe 613 laws. That's what the Torah says that the people had. But as Moses wrote them and everything that Moses had written, Joshua 8 will tell you the details. Uh, indeed, were written on those stones. It wasn't two stones. It was stone after stone after stone after stone. Because what was upon it? How, how would they inscribe uh, their sayings of the law upon it? You got plaster. It's, not going to, it's only going to form cement as the rocks are joined together, but also it formed that which they can inscribe upon. Uh, gypsum, limestone, that type of thing was there, there taking place. Thirdly, why was an altar to be constructed of unhewn stones? Because Exodus 20 and 25 says when you lift up a, a, a tool, you will pollute the altar. So you're not going to pollute the altar. They're unhewn stones, and we talked about that. Question number four, why were the people to be silent and hearken? Look at verse nine. And Moses said unto the priests and Levites, say to the people, keep silence and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of Jehovah thy God. I thought they all were God's people, always. But today, what's understood? We got a new generation of Jewish people, the kids, the young ones, that uh, maybe the young ones that went through the wilderness wanderings, they're of age now after 40 years of wandering. And they, they are now having this same law that was written. And that's why Deuteronomy's second law needs to be understood in a context. It wasn't new laws. They may have made new application after these times, but it wasn't a, a new law. It was, it was new for a new generation. And this is emphasized all through the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, that's uh, something you come across, and we'll come across it uh, before we get through chapter 30 in, uh, in lesson number eight. But that's where we come to this evening, that they're to hearken unto this law. They were to write it upon the stones. We talked about last time that when it came up out of the, the Jordan River, they didn't do these stones. They were to pick up stones to show that the 12 tribes have passed over. This is a, this is a time afterwards. You look on a map, you cross over uh, south of, of where we're going to go tonight, and it was a little bit lesser time, uh, long, longer time. We talked about Ai being uh, taken, Jericho being taken, Ai, they messed up there, and they got, back, got their act back together. Uh, so events took place. Uh, in this, uh, this section. They just didn't cross over and then, hey, we're here uh, giving the blessings and the cursing. So uh, that's why we study all the Old Testament. We get Joshua and, and re realize that here's something that will supplement our understanding of what seems to be happening. Right when you pass over, you'll build these stones. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, in the day you do it. And that's what we understood at the close of our lesson last time. Sometimes the Bible speaks about a day, not 24-hour period, as we go back to and go back to and emphasize correctly, biblically, contextually, that's how the creation took place. It was evening, morning, one day. But the day you do that, sometimes the day you do that doesn't mean immediately on that day. And how do we know that? Because we allow context to determine the meaning of words. And that means thinking, it means look at the paragraph, look at the bigger paragraph, look at the bigger paragraph, the book, and realize, is this, is this flowing with the author's mind? Because God does not contradict himself. It flows. If we just get into that area where he's thinking and allow his words to be the contextual setting for the meaning of it. So that's one reason we study our Bibles. To, to, to be able to get in touch with that mind, to learn what God wants us to learn from his word. Not just to read our Bibles and say, I've studied. Uh, we're, we're, we're to... Find out what, what is he driving at at that particular time. So this evening, we ask a question number five. Describe the scene of the blessings and cursings from Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. I want us to look at the scene. And when you put together Joshua 8 and you put everything together of what we're about to see here in, in 
latter part of, of chapter 27 going into chapter 28. In your mind, you ought to have a picture of that, of that scene, of what's occurring, when's occurring, what's happening, what's, what's being set forth there. And so I wanted to give you a picture of the way uh, the scene is today. That indeed you have, do you feel like, feel like you have two, uh, you might call them hills? Could they be mountains? If we're looking at a far off distance? One, two, I can count two. Do we have two mountains being set forth here in the text of this scene of the blessings and the cursings? Just say yes or no. I'd like to see if you're with me, okay? Yes or no? I see two, and we know there's some mountain. In fact, they're named. Once I have, we have Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, could you tell me where the blessings are going to be set forth? From what mountain? Gerizim. And where, when the, the Samaritan woman in John 4, when she said, in this mountain we worship, which one of the two would, were they worshiping? Hint? What, which mountain is it? It's Mount Gerizim. Because that's where the blessings came. Why couldn't they say Mount Ebal? <laughs> Why couldn't they say Mount Ebal? It's a lot higher. Well, 200, 200 feet higher, maybe, in that area region. But they said, no, uh, it's Mount Gerizim. It's with this mountain we, we, uh, we worship. And uh, again, it's the same, you know, I don't have anything from God that said this is what we're going to do other than what we see here. But the Samaritans, you know, part Jews, part non-Jews, that's where they worshiped in Mount Gerizim. And we see a city here in this particular setting. Was the city here when the people came across to conquer land? They conquered Jericho, they conquered Ai, they're coming up north and they're going to, uh, in this area, was there a city already there called Shechem? Or is this modern, uh, you know, camera work? Oh, that's, that's just modern Shechem today. Was that a city already? When the people of Israel came over and had the blessings and the cursings, or was that just brush and sand and scrubby trees? What picture do you get? Set the setting in your mind. Is Shechem there? When Abraham came from Mesopotamia, where did he go? Shechem. That's Abraham. When did these people cross over? Long after Abraham. Before these people crossed over, Jacob came through there in Shechem. And one of the things we need to understand, it is a very ancient city because geography will determine a lot of times where settlements are. There's a well there, I know. There was water that would come up out of the ground. And between these two mountains, what? Almost 3,000 square feet high and, and a little bit over 3,000 feet high. That's no big deal. You know, in our thinking of mountains. But it was a way in which people could travel through that section. They could go and connect with the, the central. It was in the central part of, of Israel. Wouldn't that be a good place for things to happen? And it did. It would worship God there in, in Shechem. Uh, before they made Samaria, their capital city, the northern kingdom, God's people, Israel, would be there for a while. But it was a passageway to come through those mountain ranges, which then led to, to Jerusalem, finally, if you go through that. We're looking, we're looking from the east here, and, uh, and the, the city was indeed south uh, east of Mount Gerizim and directly east of Ebal. So you have the geography that says, there's, there's been a people there for a long time. And that's exactly true. Now, it used to be they would have olive trees there in Mount, on, on this side of Mount Ebal. And history has set forth a lot of things that, that took place with the children of Israel that were there. But that had been a city that's been there for a long time and still is, Shechem. And 
that's one interesting thing about it. They were conquering a people already there. But here, what you would also have a way in which maybe somebody could stand on the slopes of one mountain and stand on the slopes of another mountain, and you could hear them. You could hear what they had to say. One was indeed offering blessings. Others, people were offering curses. Now, when we come to chapter 27, there are 12 curses that are mentioned there. So where would they be uttered from? Mount Ebal. Now, you go to Joshua 8, you'll see the scene unfold. The Ark of the Covenant there is there. And you've got six of the tribes of Israel on one side of Mount Gerizim. And could you tell me who their mothers were? The six that are on Mount Gerizim offering the, uh, the blessings that they're going to uh, set forth? Chapter 27 and verse 12, Mount Gerizim. These are the people that passed over Jordan. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Who were their mothers? Leah and Rachel. Those on the side of Ebal, where did those tribes come from? Two of them came from Leah because you had to have six on each side. But the four that are mentioned there came from Leah and Rachel's handmaids. They're offering the curses. I don't know if there's any symbolism there or not, but it's a fact. And so you see how they divided uh, the people. Here, Leah and Rachel, and these are the, these are the, the seed of promise in which things would would come and instead of the handmaids, they, they indeed this was indeed going to happen that was connected with them and, and they were all there uh, on the ones giving the blessings. Maybe that's where uh, the Samaritans wanted, said that's, where we're, that's the mountain we're worshiping in, Gerizim, when he was right there, Mount Gerizim, because it was blessing, there was freedom. There was uh, idea from the, these two women that are indeed wives and that's that Concubines or handmaids. But that's what we see taking place there. They also had the Ark of the Covenant right there between the two mountains. And on each side were the people of Israel. You're going to have women, children. They're all going to be listening. And kind of like an amphitheater. We've been to places like that where, you know, you just hear the sound. But over the years, they've done a lot of, of testing to see how far off could you hear somebody when they were upon those mountain ranges and the shepherds and Bedouin shepherds and those who gone through there, they, they've heard some distinct language when they're very far off. And we sometimes, how come Jesus could uh, do his sermon on the mount and, and be heard by such a multitude of people? Geography matters. And a lot of times when we see this, this provided that where not only you could hit the slopes, but people could hear as that sound ran through the valley. And the people were down there in the valley and they were standing before, on each side of the Ark of the Covenant, because that's, that's where God's presence is. Now, you've got Levi on Mount Gerizim, but you, but you also have the Levites that are down there by the Ark of the Covenant. Levi, Levi, they can't do that. Why would that be? Because when you look at Joshua 8, the Levites down here were the priests that carried the Ark of the Covenant. So the rest of the tribe, the leaders of the tribe of, of representatives of the tribe of Levi are up there on Mount Gerizim. The priest, what tribe were they from? So we don't have a contradiction. They came from Levi too. But they were priests with a special job of carrying that Ark of the Covenant. And they were there. And so the blessings, blessings, I don't see that here yet in trying to describe this moment. But Joshua 8 will tell us that that's indeed what, uh, what took place. Verse 34 of Joshua 8, there were blessings and cursings. So what might the scene look like? Could you might say 
verse chapter 28 and verse 3, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Now remember, Deuteronomy is not talking about any blessings in chapter 27. We'll come back to hit, hit some of these uh, 12 of these curses. Just curse. And it shall come to pass, thou shalt hearken diligently in chapter 28. Seem like we're going on a new, uh, new scene. But Joshua says there were blessings and cursings. And all of a sudden, chapter 28, blessed shall be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. What might immediately follow that blessing? That we would say, that's a curse. What might immediately follow? Well, chapter 28 and verse 15 reads this way. And it shall come to pass that thou wilt not hearken to the voice of Jehovah thy God to observe all the commandments and the statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall be upon thee to overtake thee. Cursed be thou, oh, cursed be thou in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. That verses 15 through 19 work well with verses 1 through 6. And well, verses 7 through 9, 7 through 10 for, for this particular section. But there would be cursings, and I think it very well could be one side, Ebal, and I hope that the hope, I would think the blessings come first, always positive. This is what you need to do. If you do that, blessed are you. You're going to be blessed in the city and the field, but cursed if you don't hearken in the city and the field. And there are 10 of these specific sections of blessings and cursings here in chapter 28. So I get to hope that sets the scene as something that you ought to picture in your mind that indeed this is historically and it still is a place you say, I can see that happening there. Why, why blessing and curse? Why? And, and that's where they set up the altar, they set up the stones that it were inscribed on by all the, the law that Moses had written down when he was uh, writing there before the people of God. They said the same thing in Joshua 8 that happens. So that may have taken some time. It may have been all these different specific laws that they say 613, magic number. Could be the Ten Commandment laws. And so it, it could be that type of thing. Let's, let's talk about Ten Commandment laws. Look at question number, number six. Uh, the first, any, any questions or comments you want to add? I, I, I gave my scene. What, what uh, maybe it was interesting to you that you see that you could uh, want to talk about? Okay. Question six. Of the first 11 curses from the law, what do they have in common? They're very specific. Uh, what does it mean? And this will, this will help you, I think, get our thoughts going. Verse 15 of chapter 27. Cursed be the man that maketh a graven or molten image, an abomination unto Jehovah, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and, and setteth them up in secret. Setteth them up in secret. I, I'm not going to go public with this thing, but I'll have them in my home. That's kind of where the people that they have been around, the, 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 the people they've conquered, They've seen that, they may be doing that. And all the people shall answer and say, hear it from, the, hear it from that valley, amen, amen. Or if they're not texting, amen, whatever. But they, they say that. Now, is there a, one of the Ten Commandments that that reminds you of? That they just violated when they did that? Or not? First one, you know, I have no other gods before me. You're not going to make images. So could it be that the rest of these, or at least the next uh, 10, would be violation of the specific Ten Commandments? You're going to have to look, beyond, beyond, look below the surface of application, and that's okay to do that. Because, see, that's how law is observed. We, we have application that honors that. I think we could see that in the very first curse. That's definitely, you're transgressing the, command, the Ten Commandments. Well, what about this one? Cursed is he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he that setteth light 
by his father and his mother. Which law did that violate? said, don't wake my parents up. Don't put a light where, where they're sleeping. I thought about that when I was little. Not that I did that. But what does it mean? All right. Honor your father and mother. Is that a commandment? Is this honoring your father and mother when you hold them in contempt? They're like case with you? Maybe. These do apply to the Ten Commandments. That indeed would be an application of how maybe here comes a new generation. We speak a little differently. We, we, make, we make a different application than what we may have seen before. But this has been, you know, this is not the first time it, this is, is setting forth there. I mean, it, that was in the law. Specific application. But it, you can go back to the Ten Commandment law and draw some some. So points of application, which I want us, want us to do. Now, here's, here's where I had a problem. <laughs> tell me which law, if it's the Ten Commandment law, tell me, cursed is he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say amen. Which Ten Commandment law did that violate? And what do you have? You've got a blind person. And you're making them go out of the way? You sure don't have compassion for your brother who is in need. But see, the first five commandments are dealing with our relationship with, with God. And on the next stone is the commandments dealing with our neighbor, our fellow people that we come in contact with. And the one... The close like it is, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. He's not killing anybody. But how did Jesus take the people, said, thou shalt not kill, but if you want your brother, you are a murderer. If you hate him, if you hate your brother. Are you showing any regard for caring about your brother? Or would you just be willing, his hatred, he's causing me trouble. Hatred, so is, is, Jesus looked upon that as being a problem of thou shalt not murder. And he is applying it to have anger and hatred in your heart. And John uses that to show that that's who a murderer is. They have no life in them. And so that's the only one that I have to stretch a little bit, but the rest of them fit this. Cursed is he that maketh, uh, cursed be he verse 19, that resteth justice due to the sojourner, fatherless, and widow? What, would that be, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor? What if he's just a sojourner? What if he's just an orphan? What if he's, she's just a widow? We don't care about her. But what, what you do, you rest with justice from, from that person. And the people so say, say amen. What about verse 20, 21? 22, 23, what would uh, Ten Commandment law would that violate? You put them in a category. Oh, they're different applications. If your father's wife, your sister, who happens to be recognized in a time where you might have fathers that have one child and maybe a different mother in the families, he'll, you know, your sister may be Daughter of your father, the daughter of your mother. What was the daughter? Both of them. No, they're just married. <laughs> no, you had different fathers and you had different mothers in a family. But it's your sister. So you got that. Uh, he lieth with his mother-in-law, verse 23. So different applications of what commandment thou shalt not do. What is it? Commit adultery. It all fits there. And curses he that smiteth his neighbor in secret. And all the people so say, amen, amen, thou shalt not kill. Definitely dealing with, with that. And here's the one that sums it all up. What did these 11 have in common? I think you can trace them back to the Ten Commandments. And what is interesting, when the law condemns, and every, every transgression of the law received a just recompense or reward, which was death, 
You can go through and every one of those Ten Commandments that were violated carried the death penalty. Every one of them. And there were people that died because they, you, you dishonor your father and mother, we'll stone you to death. And those were, so there's, he's focusing in on like Ten Commandments. I think these do that, but what do we see in, in verse, uh, verse 20, 26? Cursed is he that confirmeth not the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say what? They shall say, say, say amen. So what is this demanding of the people now, this twelfth one, this last one? Our next question. What is this demanding of the people of God? When they hear, this is what you shall do, what's demanding of them? And if they don't, they've just been guilty from their own mouth. Echoing between, in, in the areas of, of Gerizim and Ebal, you made a covenant with your God, a, a promise that you're going to do those things. And he put that in there. When you don't do that, that's going to be uh, a problem. And you will, your own words will, will condemn you. He puts that in. He sums up the the first 11 that we see there. Any questions on those specific applications of the law? And people say, well, you just, just tell me what the law is. Tell me what Jesus' law is, and, and you don't have to worry about application. Application is very, very, very important. And we're going to see that we need to understand what is on the mind of God when he makes the application. That's what we'll see. How would God's people hear the voice of God or know of his ways? Now, question number eight. How would, they, uh, how would they do that? Now we're opening up chapter 28. What does verse one tell us? It shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Jehovah thy God to observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day that Jehovah thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And blessings he begins to talk about will take place. So tell me, when they, they hear the voice of God, how are they supposed to hear it? Diligently, <clears throat> my Bible says, and they hearken diligently. That means be fast to understand what he's saying. Listen to it. He's already made them realize that they're, they're, they're going to be involved in uh, confirming it. And always, like in verse 25, you either take it the bribe. You know, there's the idea of <coughs> extortion from people and, and being a false witness and so forth to, to take justice away from others. Ten Commandment law. And they're going to hearken diligently. But what's the goal of their hearkening? Oh, we just got good knowledge now. What are they supposed to do with that knowledge? Do it. They were to put it into practice to observe all that I command thee. Every one of the things that God said. What would you say, Lord? You got a new one? You got another one? I'm listening. I'm that intent. That's the people of God. And there's great principles to, uh, to learn there. All right. Question number nine. What is a blessing according to God? Is the blessing to lend to nations? Or is the blessing to have the ability to borrow? From nations. Which is it? Or does it matter to you? You say, well, it makes no difference. We could borrow from you. That's using leverage. That's good. That's good economics. No, not so with God. Did he make a choice between those two? Look at verse 12 with me. Jehovah opened thee his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain of thy land in its season and to bless all the work of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Now, that's our point. But you'll get it when you understand the context. What's the context? Prosperity. Who's giving it to you? He gives his treasure from heaven. He gives to you. You're going to have so much in abundance. People are going to borrow from you. Because you are being blessed. You're not borrowing from them. That's not a blessing to borrow from other people. Where did you learn that? I learned it from, from God. And that doesn't mean not to borrow. 
and not to put up your money for interest and so forth, that that's not a, you know, we'll see in the New Testament, that's something at least you could have done in order to do those things. But in this context of a nation being blessed, he's emphasizing that, it, well, well, how come you went down into Egypt in order to get grain? You went, we bought it. We, we bought it. And, but we had to get it from their ground and not ours because of that. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an, a limited application for effect. That is indeed, you, you, if, people, if you're going to borrow from other people, it shows you you're lacking something and you're not being blessed. I'm going to bless you so that that won't happen. That's the blessing side. And sometimes we, we, won't, we think we'll be blessed because we can borrow a lot. And that's not the way he looked at it. How intrusive would be the curse if God's people did not heed the commandments of God? Just how intrusive in their life were these curses here in chapter 28? There's a number of them that are staggering. But if you want to make a blanket observation from what you've read, how intrusive is it? In every facet of your life, you would suffer from it. I don't, I don't see where he, he eliminates anything that your life is not going to depend upon him and that he's not going to search you out and find you. In fact, some of the imagery is, is that these particular curses will chase you, overtake you, and destroy you. Now that's intrusiveness. You see a guy kind of get in the way of a robber of a bank, and they just keep tracking you. And they keep tracking, and they will catch you, and they will destroy you. That's pretty intrusive in your plans to spend the stolen money. Let's notice in verse 15 through 19, and, and we'll, we will, let's look at the blessing side first, which I think they're going to blessings and cursings, and you'll see this in verses 3 through 6, there are 10 areas of their life that will be blessed. Let's start there. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Why does, he, why does he put those two parameters there? Does that cover? That just about covers everywhere you're going to live, isn't it? What do we do? Urban rule. Are the neighborhoods near urban areas? Are we urban or are we rural? How come you want to retire and go to the country if this is rural? <laughs> this is city life, isn't it? And it's city, field. He's going to bless you. Blessed be the fruit of thy body. Or that means my children. That's getting pretty intrusive into my life. Fruit of thy ground. Oh, that's where I plant. These things are going to bring those fruit. And the fruit of thy beast. And he tells them the increase of thy cattle and the young of thy flock. Either in our Western days, did cattlemen like to be on the same land with sheep herders? Sheep stink. But what's the problem? Sheep will eat the grass to the roots. And my cattle won't have anything to eat. So we had range wars all the time during that time. Well, he talks about cattle and he talks about flock. Flock of cattle or flock of sheep? Adam, that's pretty, that, that kicks care of well my business I'm going to do. And he'll take care of the wild west too. Blessed shall be, and here's where it's interesting, blessed shall be thy basket and thy kneading trough. And some of you don't have trough, but you have bowl in your translation. So what's that a contrast of? And it's beautiful when you get it. We've seen parameters. So this must be a parameter that has a meaning. It's just not words. It has a meaning. What would you put when you put the, the produce from the ground? You might put it in a wicket basket to carry it. And then what did you do with it? You needed grain, dough. You need it in your kneading trough. It said, I'm going to put it to use. I'm going to make some bread. But I put it in my basket. He'll bless both sides of that. 
the crop and your use of it. Your use of that. Well, look at verse 12. Well, look, we'll, look, we'll look at verse 15 in a minute. Follow me, but let's just go ahead and look at it now because I want to get that, that point. Because these are not in the same order. We've already seen about the field and the city in, in verse 15. But he says in verse 17, Cursed shall be thy basket and thy, and I'm American standard, kneading, like kneading bread, kneading trough or bowl. So there he puts the opposite there. Blessing, cursing. Cursed be the fruit of thy body, fruit of thy ground, the increase of thy cattle. And then, cursed shalt thou be when thou goest in and comest out. And that's part of the blessing in verse 6. When thou comest in and comest out. So, what existence is this blessings and cursings not in existence? Paul, when he came to Jerusalem, he was with them going in and going out. What? Well, is there anything in between? Well, yeah, you can, he's, we're sitting still. Coming in, going out. But that's a picture of where, wherever you go. You're going to be blessed or you're going to be cursed. And those ten in each section are specifically mentioned, but they cover uh, so much of the, of the categories of, of this. Let's, and I know our time is short, but I want us to... Let's drop down to verse, 20, uh, verse 29. See how intrusive things can be. Let me, let me, let me, let me, because of time. Let, let me go to verse 30, uh, 30, 35. And it's just imagery there. Jehovah will smite thee in thy knees in thy legs with sore balls, whereof thou canst not be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the crown of thy head. How intrusive is God in their lives with these curses? So your head, your feet sound like Job, doesn't it? What he experienced. And your legs, and all you're going you're gonna to be, be suffering uh, from, from all of that. Uh, Verse 29, and thou shalt grope at noonday, and as the blind gropeth in the darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and robbed always, and there shall be none to save thee. That's intrusiveness. That's going to be their life. They're going to be pressed, oppressed always. And yeah, but we got a Savior coming. We got somebody going to take it. You'll, nobody to save you. Nobody can save you. And verse 44, he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend, thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. And we, we didn't go the head-tail thing with lending and borrowing, but he does that earlier. And that's a sojourner. You're going to be borrowing from him. And you ought to be the head, you're the tail. That's kind of a, a, a negative point that he's, uh, that, that he's bringing up there. Um, Here's the blessing side, and this is how he Im the image. They shall come out against thee, your enemies, one way, and shall go before thee seven ways. And over in verse 25, that's the way you're going to do. You're going to be, you're going to be scattered. Seven ways, one way, but scatter seven ways. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get out. If you come in one way, that's going to happen uh, to you as, as well. And, uh, and there's a number of those. It just... One of them, uh, I was trying to see the, uh, and I can't find it here, but some of your translations will have, uh, my Bible will say consumption. When you, hear, when you see consumption, verse 22, thy sons, thy daughters shall be given to another people, and thy eyes shall look, okay, I'm at 32. It was, it was early, 22, you said that. Jehovah will smite thee with consumption. What does, what does a lot of your versions say in, 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 I, in the national, the NIV, I don't want you to talk yet. What does your version say instead of consumption, which all that means is means that you're wasting away, consumed. Okay, well, you, thank you. 
I know. That's what I wanted the NIV people to say. I didn't know you were an NIV man. But there are diseases of respiratory in nature. Have we experienced a little bit of that? We've got, we've got that kind of disease running around. They had it back then. Not necessarily that particular one. But they had the respiratory disease. And that's why the tuberculosis. Got TB in the Bible? Yeah. They translate that into our, our language. But it's respiratory problems. And they were diseases that could be catched, caught. And they had to go through that. And whether thou goest in to possess it, you're going to be suffering those things like they, they had in Egypt. So that's how intrusive it is. And again, God's involved in blessing the people or he's in, involved in, in cursing them. And if they'll keep the commandments of God, God's going to bless them. Any, any thoughts as we took a big chunk of 28 out on, on that one? And I guess that's where we'll have to stop. So our next, uh, we'll start with number 11, serving joy. It's always an interesting thing. When you're doing God's word, that ought to be joy and gladness. Because the dark side is real dark. And we'll have to, we'll have to deal with that uh, next, next time. Thank you.